Ah, the best laid plans of mice and men. Lawmakers were hoping to end the 2023 session three days from now, but there's still some pretty big bills left hanging and budgets to be balanced and approved. Plans, legislative or otherwise, often go awry. Stand up for what you believe. Well, today, several Gem State fourth graders did just that and stood up for a new state symbol. Idaho is one step closer to naming an official dinosaur. Tree Fort, with all its forts and such, is back this week. Plan on drinking a few as you head out, or you just want a free ride with some free music on the side? Well, boy, they have you covered. You know, that plan to end the session this Friday may look kind of like a pipe dream at this point, but that hasn't stopped a few bills from being flushed already today. House Bill 339, which would send an advisory question to Idaho voters in 2024 about whether they support or oppose sending public money to private or religious or for-profit K-12 schools, had failed in the House after a lengthy debate, 2743. House Bill 137, the one that would take away the option of an affidavit, signing an affidavit instead of showing your identification at the polls, that also failed on the House floor, 33 to 36. But as we're nearing the end of this legislative session, trying to slam as much as they can through, so we're going to try to slam through, well, the rest of what they went through today. So two things that did pass, the higher ed budget and Senate Joint Resolution 101 which is the one that would amend the Constitution to say an initiative petition needs to be signed by 6% of legal voters at the last general election in each legislative district. But there's a catch to this one because Reclaim Idaho is claiming there's a problem with the Senate joint resolution, which would have, have Idaho voters decide if they want to make getting an initiative on the ballot more difficult. SJR 101 was proposed back in 2021 when lawmakers wanted to require signatures be gathered from all legislative districts instead of the current 18. The state Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional. They ruled the legislature voting to change the rules was wrong. But if the people of Idaho vote to change the Constitution, well, then that would be OK. So this session, Republican Senator Doug Akunowitz, Akunowitz excuse me, of Hayden proposed doing just that. He brought forth a one page and change joint resolution, which would put the question to registered voters. And that's where Reclaim Idaho says there's looks to be a problem. Would the new rule, the new amendment to Section 1, Article 3 of the Idaho Constitution require signatures based on registered voters or would it be based on the number of people who voted in a general election? Senator Okunowitz explained it this way back in February 1st in the Senate State Affairs Committee. We had roughly 600,000 people vote in the last election. So the 6% is based off of that. Um, that amounts to just over 1,000 people per legislative district. So it's hardly an insurmountable number. So that resolution passed the committee with some amendments to it. And eventually it passed the Senate weeks later by a vote of 27 to 8. When it went over to the House side on March 9th, Senator Okunowitz said this in the House State Affairs Committee. 55,000 is not the number of people who vote in a district. So if turnout is 30% or something to that effect, uh, you're talking about 6% of that number. It's a pretty low number. It's probably less than the one I quoted you as far as the number of signatures you'd be required to gather. Okay, so you can hear him clearly say the required signatures to get an initiative on the ballot would be 6% of those who actually voted in the election. But the text of the resolution, according to Reclaim Idaho, isn't so clear. They say Section 1, Part 4 says legal voters. Before any initiative can be put to a ballot or on a ballot, there must be signatures, quote, signatures of legal voters from each legislative district equal in number to at least 6% of the legal voters at the time of the last general election. So is it voters who voted in the last general election or is it legal voters, registered voters, that is, at the time of the last general election? Because that would change things a lot. 6% of a million registered voters, which is what Idaho has, would be 60,000 signatures needed across the state. 6% of those who actually voted, which is just under 600,000, well, that would only be 36,000 total signatures needed. We did reach out to Senator Kunowitz for clarification, but we have yet to hear back. He did say in committee it was reviewed by both the former and current attorneys general, and it seemed fine, according to them. This resolution, as you heard, now waiting to be debated in the House. So they're covering a lot of ground at the state house over these last couple of days. And maybe you've noticed the pace has picked up a bit. It's probably because re Republican leadership has said for weeks that they aim to get out of here by Friday. 
Whether or not they can do it, that's still to be seen. Specifically, the work mandated by our state constitution has to be done. Lawmakers must pass state budgets before they wrap up the session, which might extend their timeline considering the House denied the Medicaid budget this week. Here's Andrew Barline. Restrictions. No. Medicaid's growing in the gem state, primarily due to voters who voted to expand coverage in 2018. Yeah, I was one of thousands of Idahoans who went door to door to gather signatures to pass Medicaid expansion. But now Representative Colin Nash is one of 20 lawmakers serving in the state legislature's budget writing committee. We have a statutory obligation to pay for Medicaid and that's what the budget as presented was. To the tune of a 16% budget increase. Yep. The House said, try again. Uh, well, we'll see tomorrow uh, how JFAC responds to what happened on the House floor. House come to order. I think we have way over jumped our numbers on this and we need to realign them. A 16% increase to me is not acceptable until we can control the budget and get some hands around it. For that, I do think we should send this back to JFAC and have them uh, sharpen the pencils. Medicaid originally provided government funded health care for people with disabilities. The expansion program extended coverage to people with low income. JFAC's proposed budget totaled nearly $4.7 billion, funded largely by the federal government and up from $2.9 billion in 2020. Everything changed um, when we had the pandemic. Democratic so Party Chair Representative Lauren Nekachea says the federal government expanded the program even further through COVID, even approving people coverage who otherwise would not qualify. Numbers from the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare show of the 450,000 people enrolled on Idaho's Medicaid roll, up to 150,000 would be removed. Because they're making too much money to qualify for Medicaid, which means they probably have private insurance, they're probably working, they're probably healthy. Several House Republicans expected the budget to drop as the state removes unqualified people from the roll. But Representative Nash says the people who don't qualify were never the expensive ones. These are healthy people, they're not using the doctor much, and they have private insurance, and Medicaid is the payer of last resort. Republicans who say we expect enormous cost savings for these people coming off the rolls just don't have their facts straight. You know, I was hopeful that Republicans would, would do the right thing. I think there was just maybe some confusion among um, freshman lawmakers about how the Medicaid budget works. Lowering the budget doesn't necessarily lower the amount of money the state spends either. Uh, a lot of these um, a lot of these things are non-discretionary, meaning that they are governed by statute. It just changes what the state plans to spend. And if they're wrong, increases the risk that funds run out and we have to do a fix mid-year. The bill is just less responsible and more risky. Just gets paid at a later date. What that means is we're just punting. We're just kicking that can down the road until that bill is due next year. Uh, that means we might have to hold provider payments so hospitals might not get, and doctors might not get paid on time uh, until we get our act together and fund uh, the budget like we're supposed to. Now, there are pieces to this budget that are malleable when we talked with Representative Nash, and there are a few things that upset him that could potentially happen that he's hoping don't happen, Brian. So when we talk with Nash and Nekachea in tandem, they're concerned about people um, who have, like, in-home care, things mm. of that nature. There are certain things that can change. There are decisions that can be made to save money. Large amounts of money, it's unclear, um, but there are some small things that can change that would reduce services for specific groups of people. And when we talk with the Democrats today, uh, they're really hoping that that does doesn't happen, but of course it's a committee of 20 people and yeah. we'll see where it goes. Everybody's got an opinion on that. That's a, that's a big committee. It is interesting, budgets, one of the most dry things that they talk about at the State House, but for the last two years, th last year and this year, last year was libraries, this year it seems to be Medicaid, holding things up here at the end of the session, which you think a lot of things, after they sort all that out, we just get rubber stamped to kind of send through, but apparently not. I even joked with them, like, are we going to have a long night where we're looking at budgets and you guys are staying super late? And Ordering pizza? Nobody really answered that. They kind of were like, ha, ha yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so I guess we're in the same boat. At least it won't be done on Friday. At least that's the way it looks at this point. It appears so. All right. Thank you, Andrew. It's nerve wracking. It's stressful. And my stomach kind of just dropped. Like now I have to reestablish with another place and I have to drive to have my baby. And we're not talking just across town driving. We're going to stick with health care here for a minute because it's affecting everyone across the state. By May 19th, the only hospital in Sandpoint, Idaho, Bonner General Hospital, won't be delivering babies anymore, which is already having an effect on expected parents, including Leandra Wright, who's used to Bonner General being her home hospital. It's where she had a baby back in 2020. 
my last two babies that I've had have been quick. So hopefully, hopefully I make it. <laughs> my 15 year old son, um, I lived about 40, 45 minutes from the hospital and it was fortunately the dead of winter and he was born on the side of the highway because we couldn't make it. Wow, well Bonner General Health announced Friday they are closing their labor and delivery department. They said it's because of two things. There are fewer births taking place at Bonner, just 265 last year, and they've lost too many pediatricians, but also because of Idaho's political climate, saying, quote, the Idaho legislature continues to introduce and pass bills that criminalize physicians for medical care nationally recognized as standard of care. Legislation like, say, I don't know, the abortion law, transgender treatments for minors, those kind of things, just to name, a two, name two of them. The president of the General Health Board says they've made every effort to avoid closing that section of the hospital, but feel they have no other choice at this time. They called the decision emotional and difficult. Kootenai Health in Coeur d'Alene, which is an hour away, by the way, has had a longstanding relationship with Bonner General Health. They'll be providing women's health services along with Kootenai Health's Family Birth Center and Sandpoint Women's Health. Kootenai Health says both hospitals will be working together to limit any barriers to care for patients who are caught in the middle of this closure. Well, so they won't have to have babies in the middle of the highway like Leandra. I realize that there is more to, to, uh, to legislation than just grown-up stuff. And it is important to teach our kids about legislation. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about grown-up stuff at the State House, even if it is grown-ups talking about kid stuff, like libraries, bathrooms, and gender-affirming care. But Senator Kevin Cook right there from Idaho Falls is right. It's time to focus on the stuff actually important to kids, like what was happening today at the House State Affairs Committee. They were hearing testimony on Senate Bill 1127, sponsored by Senator Cook, and the one which would give Idaho a new state symbol, a state dinosaur. So let's take a look at fourth graders learning about the legislative process and acting like adults. All right, we'll give you two minutes today for testimony. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Harper Lehman, and I live in Meridian, Idaho. I'm a fourth grader at Montessori Academy, and I am here today in support of Senate Bill 1127. Good morning. My name is Ethan Moon. I, I represent the fourth grade class at Yukon Elementary School in Yukon, Idaho. My name is Jed Wheeler. I'm a fourth grader at Rimrock Elementary in District 35. I am here to testify on behalf of Senate Bill 1127. My name is Elliot Bybee and I go to Lowell Elementary. My name is Levi Hurry and I'm a fifth generation Idahoan. I live in District 32 and attend Edgemont Gardens Elementary School in Idaho Falls, Idaho. I'm proud to stand with so many awesome fourth graders around the state who are lobbying to get a new state symbol, a state dinosaur. 
Fourth grade is when we learn Idaho history. I love studying Idaho history and it makes me proud to live in Idaho. We get to learn about Lewis and Clark's expedition with Chicago, Chicago and the state flag. I look forward to learning about Idaho's state bird, state flower, and state gem. Some of my favorites are the Syringa and the Bonarch butterfly. We live in a really cool place, but we have no we have room to improve our state's symbols by adding a state <coughs> dinosaur. I think it's amazing that scientists are still discovering new dinosaurs right here in Idaho. I live in Bonneville County, which is where the dinosaur, Erectodromius, was discovered. Erectodromius lived in Idaho 95 million years ago. The Erectodromius would be the best dinosaur to represent our state for three reasons. One, Idaho is the only state where a complete skeleton of the Erectodromies has been found. That is cool. Of all the dinosaurs we have found, Erectodromies is the only proven dinosaur to burrow for safety and, re and for raising its own. Two, Erectodromies was a good mother and took care of its children. Families are very important to Idahoans. Three, Erectodromies was small for a dinosaur and very fast. It was a kind of a small dinosaur, only 11 feet long and weighing about 70 pounds. Three, Erectodromus worked hard to keep itself and family safe, again, just like Idahoans. Because the Erectodromus was discovered here and had family values like ours, I believe it is a perfect fit to be Idaho's first state dinosaur. Please vote yes on Senate Bill 1127. And send this to the House floor with a due pass recommendation. The new symbol is good for fourth graders and good for Idaho. Thank you, and I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Are there questions? Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The motion is carried. It will be done. But you know, if there were questions, I bet you those kids would have all the answers that they'd be asked. You know, they were ready. They had all the information. Joe Walton, the teacher from Yukon Elementary in Eastern Idaho, whose fourth grade class came up with the idea for a state dinosaur, he was thrilled today to see such overwhelming support for their bill. Kids from Idaho Falls to Rimrock to Meridian all testifying today in favor of a new state symbol. The idea for a new state symbol now headed to the House where a majority vote will send it to the governor for his signature. Senate Bill 1127 passed the Senate, by the way, unanimously last week. So no pressure, House members.
We got to enjoy some spring sunshine earlier today. Meantime, a powerful storm bearing down on California will send some precipitation into southern Idaho overnight tonight and eventually track to the south of us through the day tomorrow. As we take a look at future cast, I really think that this is more of a Magic Valley event. It should be a non event really for the Treasure Valley, but for the Magic Valley, some minor slushy accumulations are possible. Twin Falls, especially as you get south of Twin Falls toward Jackpot, Nevada into northern Nevada through the overnight hours. Then we wait until tomorrow afternoon to see another round of some scattered spotty showers moving through the region. Looks like just rain for valley locations once again and some light snow showers for our mountain locations and the forecast continues to stay fairly active Thursday into Friday into the weekend when we're expecting some colder temperatures as well. So not a lot of snow on the way for any part of the gym state overnight tonight. But again, that snow really focused on extreme southern Idaho and especially Especially as you add a little bit of elevation. So through the Owyhees could be a couple of few inches in the highest peaks and south of Twin Falls, maybe around an inch, perhaps a little bit more as you get closer to the Nevada border. And again, as we head into Wednesday and Thursday, a chance for more rain and snow showers in the forecast. Temperature is getting even cooler, 10 to 15 degrees below seasonal averages for the end of the week and into the weekend and slowly climbing back into the 50s as we enter into the beginning of next week and getting closer to the month of April. All right, the much anticipated, not just a music festival, music festival kicks off tomorrow. Tree Ford is back in Boise for five days of music. They got yoga, food, drinks, robots, comedy, a whole lot more. Kind of confused by all the forts too, but that's kind of the fun of it. You just kind of bounce around and check it all out. What's even more fun though, is the way you can bounce around on a bus with a band. The iconic tree line is back. Don't know what that is? Well, we're going to take you back to 2019 when we first introduced you to this moving stage. City buses traversing the city of trees is not an unusual sight, but for four days in March, two buses in Boise become a moving musical menagerie. The Tree Fort Music Fest is in its eighth year, but this year, for the first time, organizers wanted to offer those trying to get around downtown a valley ride venue vehicle complete with its own en route ensemble. Well, not your normal everyday bus route, is it? No, it's not. It's more exciting. Yeah, it's more exciting. Yeah, it's more exciting. gives festival goers an option to get from place to place with the soundtrack provided by a seven piece bluegrass band from Alaska known as good, not great. What is great is this libaceous loop will take you across a 10 block stretch of Boise along Main and Idaho streets with six stops conveniently located near tree fort stages while the band plays on. OK, so some of those stops may change over the years, but here we are in year 11. Tree line is still going strong and for the now five day festival. Bus is going to run from 6 p.m. Remember, it's five days. It's going to run from 6 p.m. to midnight starting tomorrow through Saturday. It takes you from the new main stage, which is in Julia Davis Park to other downtown venues. It's a loop that goes around every 10 minutes. Plus, if you have a wristband, you can ride any Valley Regional Transit bus for free from Wednesday to Saturday. But take note, there won't be any buses on Sunday. So if you park downtown, you're not going to get home or get down to get your car. Sadly, we couldn't find Good Not Great, the band in this year's lineup, but there will be plenty of other bands out there, bluegrass and beyond, both on the tree line and pretty much everywhere else around Boise.
All right, just a quick update. We have just learned that Governor Little has vetoed House Bill 133. That's the one that would give parents the right to teach their children how to drive. Uh, that uh, was also not enough votes in the House to overturn that veto. Governor Little saying that he didn't feel it was safe for parents to train their kids or teach their kids since it wouldn't be possible to ensure, well, they were doing it properly. So that one did not pass or did not get the governor's signature and did not get the votes to overturn his veto in the House today. Let's get to your comments like this one. Archaic medical laws, physicians fleeing the state and lack of property tax reform. Yeah, that'll get businesses to move to this state. Good job, legislators, legislators. 60,000 versus 36,000, given legislators an inability to do math and write accurate bills. Perhaps they should spend more time passing legislation to fund our schools, says David in Boise. Remember when one of the dinosaurs at the state house wanted to ban anyone under 18 from testifying? The grade schoolers testifying on the state dino was the best thing to come out of the Capitol today, says Mike in Nampa. And I you know, tend to agree with you, Mike. As a former fourth grade teacher, my heart was full watching the student's testimony today in favor of adopting a state dinosaur. They were so poised and articulate. That's from Lori, by the way. And yeah, they did very well today. We had to show that because it was awesome to see them do it. I'm afraid the dinosaur bill won't pass in the House because too many members think it's woke to believe the Earth is more than 6,000 years old. Rod coming in with fire today. We'll see you back here tomorrow.